Okay, okay. Well, it's lovely to be here today. Um, as Deborah has already said in her introduction to the day, um, the Cantus Manuscript data Database is a wonderful example of how crowdsourcing can generate a large amount of data within a scholarly and rigorous online forum. But as I'm about to speak um, about now, um, in order for crowdsourcing to be useful, both for contributors and users of data, it's essential for there to be protocols in place that govern how and what information is collected. Establishing protocols, as Deborah already suggested, serves as quality control for crowdsourced content. It also facilitates successful retrievers by users and provides a clear record of decision making at the content management level. So between um, the fall of uh, 2014 and December 2015, I created, um, along with other um, scholars and contributors, various multiple protocol documents for Cantus. And these documents can be found at, uh, the, on the Cantus website, cantus.waterloo.ca slash documents. Oops. And these include the Volpiano protocols, which provide step-by-step -step guidelines on how to input and format melodic transcriptions in the Cantus database. The Volpiano Noom protocols, which were designed to help student research assistants transcribe specific Noom shapes from manuscripts dating from the 11th to 16th centuries and from various geographic regions into the Cantus database. The text entry and editing guidelines, which help contributors to distinguish between the standardized text field and manuscript text fields in Cantus. The guide to indexing graduals, and these were developed when Cantus expanded from a uh, resource for the indexing of antiphoners um, to include graduals. And then um, two further documents, which aren't exactly protocols, but there's also the Quick Guide to Liturgy, which help less experienced contributors understand the liturgy itself and the manuscript page. And then Volpiano Editing Guidelines, which help Cantus editors to troubleshoot the editing process and navigate the Cantus interface as an editor. So a lot of documents. Sometimes I wonder, do we need so many? <laughs> and when do they become onerous? that have so many, but anyway, we'll continue. So during the creation of these various documents, I wrestled with questions of content, what actually needs to be in the protocols, but also questions of use. How should protocols be presented so that they are as easy as possible to absorb and implement, given that there's such a wide range of contributors um, who contribute to Cantus? And throughout the protocol creation process, I also realized that good protocol documents require significant knowledge of the sources and of the source types being crowdsourced with one catch. In the case of crowdsourcing, one does not always know in advance the range of data that will be collected and contributed or the issues that new contributors will bring to the table. New manuscripts often introduce issues that have not yet been considered, for example, how does a contributor input data from a damaged manuscript folio in which the content is only half visible? Or what do we do when a contributor wants to include manuscript bar lines? Because for the contributor, these bar lines have significance, but our protocols and interface don't accommodate such bar lines. And this is a, a scenario that did arise, and this is some of the brainstorming we did to try and accommodate um, that contributor's desire to in include those bar lines. Before we released our various protocols for viewing on, viewing on the Cantu site, which happened about a year ago, we had to wrestle with these and numerous other questions. And now that the protocols are public, I suspect new issues will still arise, which itself raises the issue of protocol management. Not only do we need to manage crowdsourced content with protocols, but we also need to manage our protocols by addressing questions such as, when is an update truly required? If an update is implemented, does that corrupt previous versions of the data? And once a, cha a change to the protocols are made, how do we notify contributors, or do we need to notify contributors? So I'm going to follow up on these questions, but first I want to consider three other issues in some greater depth. Um, quality control of crowdsourced content, collaboration, and then user friendliness of detailed protocol documents. So one of my first responsibilities with the Cantus project was to edit Volpiano transcriptions from the Salzine Antiphonal, as well as other manuscripts in process. 
And for those of you unfamiliar with Vulpiano, it's a font developed by Fabian Weber at the University of Regensburg under the direction of David Hiley that encodes a chant melody as a searchable text string using alphabetic characters and other symbols. And you can see here um, an a snippet from a manuscript, the Vulpiano that's used to transcribe and then how that appears in the database as actual notation. As I reviewed transcriptions of melodies into Vulpiano in Cantus, I found that the same noom shape would be transcribed with different approaches to the spacing of pitches by a single contributor within the same manuscript, as well as across different manuscripts. And this perhaps didn't matter to a researcher interested only in melodic content, and Cantus itself is clear that transcriptions in Cantus are not additions. On the other hand, the work of an editor is to ensure accuracy and consistency, and it would take little time for a contributor to learn a few basic guidelines regarding nooms to create cleaner and more consistent transcriptions. And so here you see um, one noom shape from a manuscript and then three different approaches to transcribing them, which are three different approaches that occurred in various transcriptions in Cantus. So in order to create greater uniformity in the approach to melodic transcription, we introduced a few basic principles largely concerned with when to transcribe pitches as connected noom shapes and when to transcribe them as disconnected. And this is the list of guidelines that we created and no need to read them just to say that that's what they are and they're there. And these guidelines were further supplemented with examples of specific nooms from specific manuscripts with recommended transcriptions. And so here we have the Volpiano noom protocols. And as you can see in this slide, rows of, the rows of nooms illustrate continuity and change between noom shapes over time with the earliest manuscripts represented on the left and then moving forward um, through time towards the right. I hope, I always mix up left and right, so I hope I got that right. Yeah, left, left, right, yeah. <laughs> Um, the nooms in each row are all from the same text syllable of the same concordant chant across different manuscripts. And using concordant chants in this way helped identifying unusual, hard to identify nooms, while further ensuring that the noom protocols for a single manuscript were relevant within the breadth of the chant heritage. And although scholars might disagree with the recommended transcriptions that we um, suggested here, the Volpiano noom protocols at the very least document a decision-making process. One of the problems with a document like the Volpiano Noom Protocols is that it was built outwards from a set of pre-selected manuscripts that were studied and compared um, to then provide these transcription suggestions. But with crowdsourced content, it's not always feasible to study a manuscript in advance and provide Noom transcription recommendations. As more and more manuscripts are indexed in Cantus and more and more melodies added, the Volpiano Noom Protocols function, um, I think, more as a record of decisions made than as an exhaustive guide. That said, there is another supplementary document available on the Cantus database that allows each contributor to record his or her own Noom transcription choices, and each contributor is then encouraged to provide this document upon completion of the manuscript as a resource for the editor. So although um, I took the lead in creating the Volpiano Noom protocols and the other documents that I've described, I by no means undertook this work alone. And as you'll see at the top of each protocol document, including this one, there's a list of names that show who contributed to the development of each set of protocols. And these range from Deborah as Cantus project manager, also Jennifer, who's gonna be speaking later today as a Cantus co-investigator, also Jan Kolacek, project developer in charge of interface and programming. Other scholars, including Inga Berendt, as well as student assistants, including Claire Neal, Alessandra Iniesti, etc. During regular Cantus meetings, we would bring questions to the table, observe and record current issues facing various Cantus contributors. And as the protocols developed, I would get student research assistants to test the protocols, seeing what was clear and what was still confusing. As I edited Cantus data myself, I would further notice where contributors were inconsistent or even inaccurate and try to devise ways for improving input and consistency. The Volpiano protocols, which you see here, were created through just this kind of collaborative process. We created the document to manage the transcription of melodies by graduate student research assistants into Cantus. And the importance of collaboration was especially evident when we encountered this manuscript uh, folio, which you've already seen, um, which um, 
shows significant amounts of damage. On the damaged folios, text is sometimes visible, but Noom's not, and also the reverse. And we needed to decide what to do about these folios. And so before con continuing, I just feel like I should mention at this point, um, at the second related project that, uh, called Cantus Ultimus, with, which Deborah introduced as well um, briefly in her talk, um, that Cantus Ultimus project uses data from the Cantus database along with optical music recognition to create fully searchable manuscript sources. And melody transcriptions from manuscripts into Cantus create the ground truth data against which computer readings of the manuscripts will be tested. In the case of damaged folios, not only did we need to assess what to do for the sake of researchers using Cantus, but we also had to assess the impact of our decisions on the Cantus Ultimus project. And given that the transcriptions in Cantus would provide the ground truth data for Cantus Ultimus, it seemed advisable to include all visible musical and textual content. As well, it was thought that researchers would benefit from having access to fragments of melodic information rather than no melodic information at all also textual. But in order to implement this, we needed to be sure that whatever we implemented would be technically possible, which meant consulting with the Cantus project developer, Jan Kolacek. And Jan tested and proposed various suggestions, making sure that whatever we implemented would also work with text, given that Cantus interface displays music and text together. And it was actually exceptionally complicated to come up with a guideline that would allow us to um, render the text and music from a damaged folio, but through this collaborative process it became possible. And I should also mention the student research assistant Sheila Midley Dunphy, who tested this protocol while editing transcriptions from Paris 12044, and she helped to make further refinements. And so this is essentially what we came up with, which is leaving these uh, blank areas where the music is missing um, using these half bar lines to show that missing segment. And then we had to include, um, enclose missing text with these curly brackets. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's good enough for now. So damaged folios occur relatively rarely, and as such, the damaged folio protocol is used much less frequently than the rules governing bar lines or the spacing between nooms, which need to be implemented for every chant within a manuscript. Although the protocols for bar lines and spacing were also developed through a collaborative process, I mention them now to introduce the third issue that I want to address today, that of user friendliness. So most of the protocol documents are organized with the relative importance of each individual protocol in mind. More common issues are addressed first and less common ones next. And the Volpiano protocols, for example, begin with a section on the basics and continue with less common issues like the damaged folios. Even the guide to liturgy is organized from broader concepts to more specific details, anticipating what the user needs to know first and which levels of detail can wait. The protocols also use visible examples from manuscripts as well as textual instruction whenever possible. And in the guide to liturgy, as you see here, I've annotated various folio sides in imitation of the way that a teacher might talk a student through manuscript contents. So, Here's the Roman numeral that indicates the folio side. Here's the rubric, et cetera, et cetera. In the text-heavy text entry guidelines, visual examples are frequently provided to help the, view, um, the reader assimilate the rules at a glance. And this is especially useful given that the text entry and editing guidelines include very specific instructions on how to transcribe text in two different Cantus fields, the standardized spellings field and the manuscript spellings field. So including images with the various transcription guidelines makes the protocols easier to assimilate than just text alone. And some of the protocols also include a self-test. When trained in person by an experienced Cantus contributor who can answer questions in time with you, the self-tests are not as important. But if assimilating the protocols as a novice contributor with no one to guide the process, the self-test with an answer key helps the contributor to test his or her assimilation of the protocols before beginning. And I did um, try this out with a few of the student research assistants just as a, a test itself, and they said they did find it quite helpful. Um, so although no protocol is ever, or protocol document is ever completely user-friendly, given that it wants to narrow and limit your choices as a contributor um, and control your, your process, 
These various steps aim to make the process more accessible from progressive content that begins with basics and proceeds to more rare and complex issues, to an abundance of visual examples, to these self-tests. So, if you just one more quick comment before I conclude. As I reviewed the various protocol documents this past week, as well as relevant manuscripts in Cantus, I realized that certain aspects of the protocols are gradually becoming out of date. One significant change is the development of new guidelines for categorizing a chant formula called the differentia, and I won't say too much about that. I won't say really anything about that now because Rebecca is going to be speaking about that at length after me. Um, but I mention this changing um, guideline because it reminds us that the protocols do change and we need to have a way of managing these changes and managing the documents that we create. So at present, the Cantus protocols that I've described are all available online as PDF documents. And when the document is changed, this is indicated at the top of the document with under this last revised, um, you enter when the document was last revised and by whom. Before we posted these PDF documents to Cantus, we also considered two other possibilities um, for managing our documents, however, and one was to use HTML documents that could not be downloaded, but only viewable online. A last modified date would still be included, but an HTML document meant less likelihood of a user using an out-of-date protocol from an old set of downloaded PDFs. We also considered keeping the protocols in a password protected area that would allow us to control usage of the documents and notify, notify contributors of any updates. Whether contributors are alerted with the message or whether updates are posted on documents, transparency is essential. Someone needs to manage the protocol documents ensuring that updates happen, that the documents still serve the needs of contributors, and that new ideas are employed whenever possible to make protocols ever easier to implement. Because not only do we need to manage crowdsourced content with protocols, but we also need to manage our protocol documents so that they can continue to be useful to contributors as well as good stewards of the data. Thanks.